That was a great present, uh, presentation by Mr. Lemon. He did a very good job of stating the assumptions. Um, it is important to state your assumptions in these experiments because, of course, we all know that the stir it does do work on the system. But by considering it um, very minimal, you can carry out calculations such as he did. Good job. Um, for the next presentation, I'll introduce Mr. Daniel Mazeluski, um, and he will be doing a six-minute uh, presentation on scramjet engines.
propellant used is hydrogen. Uh, it doesn't need oxygen because it's being drawn in through the air that's going through the intake. Uh, so you reduce the size of your fuel tank is needed. And a new material development, uh, it's going to produce very high temperatures. And some of the materials we have now are not going to be useful once if we want to get into those, you know, Mach 12 ranges. Uh, so new material development is going to be one critical role in the further development of these engines. Uh, some of the advantages, as I mentioned, no oxygen is needed. So you're basically going to have one fuel tank of hydrogen. Uh, it's going to help reduce the size of the aircraft and therefore the drag. Uh, no rotating parts, meaning that it's going to have fewer points of failure. There's no moving parts at all. Uh, so the high specific impulse, which I went over early, earlier, and a potentially cheaper access to outer space by reducing the rockets that we use now, the bulkiness and the fuel that we use. Uh, disadvantages cost, of course, the research costs are going to be huge, and even now we haven't made a whole lot of progress. Uh, low thrust to weight ratio, so on heavier aircraft you're not going to have a whole lot of thrust. The design drag, uh, as I mentioned with the hydrogen, it's a very, uh, or not a very dense <coughs> substance, so your tank's going to be very big, which is going to increase the drag, and uh, it's unable to operate below, su uh, below supersonic speed, so you can't actually take off from the ground using a scramjet engine. You have to be brought up to the altitude, and then you have to actually reach about Mach 4.5 or so before the scramjet engine will kick in. Uh, and that's going to be done with a different type of engine. Um, some of the current progress, uh, in 2007, Mach 10 was reached by a test engine. Um, in uh, 2010, hypersonic missiles reached uh, 5,000 kilometers per hour as about Mach 7. Um, May 27, 2010, uh, they had a scramjet engine on X-51 operate at Mach 5 for about 200 seconds, so uh, we increased the range a little. Uh, however, on August 15, 2012, there was a failed test, but that was mostly attributed to a faulty control pin and not necessarily the engine. Um, so this is that X-51, which is one of the main prototypes being used. Uh, it has the scramjet engine attached to the bottom. First went in service May 26, 2010, and the day after was when it reached Mach 5 for 200 seconds. Uh, it uses shock waves to help generate the lift, and it's a cooperative effort between a bunch of different companies, such as Boeing, Lockheed Martin, Air Force and NASA. Um, so what we could potentially do with it in the future, uh, faster travel in the commercial airlines, uh, probably not as feasible because it can't really lift uh, 747 up into the air with a different plane to get the scramjet going. Uh, space travel, as mentioned before, there's other problems that are involved with that in leading the atmosphere. And defense is the big one because uh, a lot of the tests were done with missiles. And the main, or one of the big goals is to have a missile with a scramjet engine that can strike anywhere in the world within one hour. So that would be one of the biggest uses. Um, so in review, uh, scramjet engines, they, uh, they combust the fuel at supersonic speeds, leading to higher efficiencies. And uh, it's been under development really for a long time. And uh, still a lot of work to go, but we've been reaching a lot more progress lately. So uh, hopefully we can work on this a little more. Any questions? What's the purpose of combusting fuel with supersonic speed? Is it like lower combustion temperature? No, it just it, it just is a more efficient combustion. That's what I gathered. How exactly? I'm not sure. But uh, as opposed to having to bring it down to you know subsonic speeds, combust it back up to supersonic speeds. But you, um, you said that uh, there's no moving parts. So what exactly would be nice fuel? Is that just from the heat? I mean, there's a there's an ignition source, but I'm talking about in terms of like rotating, like you know, there's no turbo machinery necessarily. In it. uh, it's just a you know, fixed body. Basically. So. so how does it work? Like how do you move the part? Well, like I said, it has to actually be brought up to speed. So once it's you know at Mach 4.5 and that gas is entering the inlet body at such high speeds and then uh, ignited and let out through the nozzle at the rear, that's when you get up to uh, the like hypersonic speeds. But if you're not at Mach 4.5 or you know in that range, then it's not gonna it's not gonna like it's just not gonna produce the uh, um, thrust necessary. So, so um, do you think it's more has to be the aerodynamics and shape of the the engine or what? Well, yeah, um, definitely because you see the. You see, like the way the nozzle is uh, created in the, uh, like in the ramjet, there, there's this uh, 
throttle right there. And uh, so that's going to reduce the speed of it a lot. So this one is just uh, taking it through at a supersonic speed as opposed to bringing it down. So, you know, if, if it wasn't designed properly, then it just wouldn't work. Or it wouldn't. I guess it would basically be a range. Does it does it operate like under the same principles in outer space, being there's no you know atmosphere? Uh, no. See, that's why I I didn't really want to go too much into space because I don't really care too much for aerospace uh, or astronautics. Um, but there's a lot of like potential problems with going into outer space, and it would probably be more of um, you know not necessarily a manned mission, but releasing a rover or something. Did you read anything about uh, an optimal um, operating altitude? I know that the reason they can't get it by club is because the vehicle destroys themselves. Yeah, I didn't actually look too much into that. I mostly read a bunch of like case studies actually, so mm -hmm. those are more specific. What uh, altitude do they think they operate in? Is it the um, different? Wait, what's that? Is it all the same kind of altitude? Like really high? Oh. I mean, it would probably be more in the middle. It was a lot, uh, a lot of the tests are done with uh, B-52s, so, you know, they're not going all the way up to the very thin atmosphere. But um, the, once they're up there, they more or less follow the, tra the trajectory of the launch vehicle, so. When you, when you say that you have to achieve Mach 4.5, is that at the beginning of the conversion nozzle or for because I don't think B-52 bombs No, um, a B-52 brings it to the altitude it needs to be at, and then a different so rocket will bring it up to that. Yeah, no, the B-52 does not go much more. Yeah, I, I realized that I should never have heard from it. So the idea pretty much is that the geometry of the intake compresses the, the gas coming in. Yeah, and gets ready for the mission. Okay. So the actual inlet has to be Mach 4, Mach 5 coming into the... Yeah, well, I mean, it's basically, it's based on the airspeed of the vehicle itself, so... So it's not the first piece of that? Yeah. And I mean, I'm not an expert on this, and really no one treats otherwise, but yeah, I'm doing my best. 